Now let's think about the normal ECG trace again. What I've already drawn myself here is an isoelectric line. And we want to use this to consider the ECG or EKG. And we'll see it's got a P, Q, R, S and a T wave. Now ECG stands for electrocardiogram as indeed does EKG. So in the States, there's a tendency to refer to EKG. In the, U in the UK, we would call it a ECG, but it's exactly the same thing. The K actually comes from the German for cardio, because I think these machines were invented in Germany. And also the K is um, consistent with the original Greek as well. So whichever you call it is fine. Now, I often get asked about the PQRST, they don't stand for anything. They have no meaning. They're completely arbitrary letters that are assigned to these different waves. That's all it is. There's nothing significant about that. So we start off on the isoelectric line. Now iso means the same. So here we don't have any significant electrical activity. But then we get electrical activity in the form of the P wave. Now the P wave goes up and it goes down. So all of that in green is the P wave, the bit that goes up and the bit that goes down. And as we see, it goes back down to the isoelectric line just here. Now what's happening here with the P wave is the P wave is caused by the depolarization of the atrial myocardium. So in the myocardium, there's lots of individual cardiac cells lots of individual myocytes. And at rest, these are going to be negative inside, about 90 millivolts negativity. So there's more negative ions inside the cell than outside the cell. And when it's at rest like that, we'll say that that is polarized. So that is the polarized cell. But then when it depolarizes, that's all going to change. So when it depolarizes, it changes to become positive on the inside and negative on the outside. So here it was negative inside and positive outside. The depolarized position is the opposite. That is depolarized. And it'll actually depolarize to about plus 20 inside for a period of time, it, then it'll be about plus 10. But what we see is it's polarized there and it's depolarized there. And the important thing about this is that it's the change from being polarized to being depolarized that initiates the muscle contraction. That's what triggers the initial muscle contraction. So the muscle sitting there in a polarized state, then it depolarizes and that's what stimulates the contraction. Now, that's the P wave. The next thing that's going to happen is there's going to be a Q wave. And that goes down and it goes back up to the isoelectric line. So that is the Q wave in yellow. And again, we see it consists of a downward deflection and an upward deflection. And then it's the P wave that carries on as the large upward deflection, which is the R wave, up and back down to the isoelectric line. So everything in red is the R wave. And then after that, this line actually carries on below the isoelectric line and then goes back up to it So it's P, Q, R, so that's the S wave there. And again, we notice the S wave has got this downward deflection followed by an upward deflection. And then we have a little more isoelectric line here. And then we have the final wave. Well, we normally count it as the final wave, which is the T.
the T wave. So P, Q, R, S and T. And again, we notice the T wave is the upward deflection and the downward deflection. That's what counts as the T wave. And then we have some more isoelectric line prior to the next P wave. Now, we've said it's the depolarization of the muscle that causes the contraction. So this depolarization here is going to stimulate atrial contraction. And that's going to go from about there to about there. So this period of time here, from the P wave to about the middle of the QRS, is when the muscular contraction of the myocardium, the atrial myocardium, generated by the depolarization of the atrial myocardium is taking place. So that's the depolarization. That's the time when the contraction takes place. And when the muscle is contracting, we call that systole. So this is the period of time of atrial systole. Now the QRS complex is the depolarization of the ventricular myocardium. And the depolarization of the ventricular myocardium will initiate the contraction of the ventricular myocardium, which will take place during this period of time here. So first we have atrial systole and then the contraction of the ventricular myocardium, ventricular systole. And all that muscle contraction is stimulated by the depolarization. But of course, in order to contract, the individual myocytes need to depolarize. But of course, they can only depolarize when they're in a polarized state. This can't depolarize again because it's already depolarized. So if we want another muscle contraction, we most certainly do, another 0.8 of a second or so. Can you see this has to go back? The depolarized has to become polarized again. It has to change from being positive on the inside back to being negative on the inside. And that process is called repolarization. Because only when it repolarizes does it become polarized again, because it can only initiate contraction when it changes from being polarized to being depolarized. So we're now in a position where we can have another cardiac contraction. So P in green, Q, R, S and T, all in their relevant colours. And what confuses a lot of people is that the wave is the upward deflection and the downward deflection. Or here, the downward deflection and the upward deflection away from this isoelectric line. Iso just meaning the same. Now, we often talk about a sinus rhythm. And a sinus rhythm is generated by the sinoatrial node the pacemaker of the heart. And a sinus rhythm has got a P, Q, R, S, T in the right order and is fairly regular. If there's a P, Q, R, S, T in the right order and it's fairly regular, but the rate is below 60, that is a sinus bradycardia. It's still initiated by the sinoatrial node, it's still fine but it's below the rate of 60, so technically it's described as a bradycardia. If you've got a PQRST in the right order and it's fairly regular, but the rate is above 100, that is a sinus tachycardia. They're the three normal rhythms. Sinus bradycardia, sinus rhythm, sinus tachycardia. And this is a, what we've drawn actually here is a cardiac cycle. So the atrial systole takes about 0 0.1 of a second and the ventricular systole takes about 0 0.3 of a second if we assume the whole cardiac cycle is about 0.8 of a second as it would be if the heart rate was around about 74 beats per minute which would be fairly normal. <laughs> 
So we see that the P wave in health can be considered to be the same as the atrial contraction. We know it's not quite the same because the atrial systole actually comes a little bit after. And we can consider the QRS to be the same as ventricular contraction. We know it's not quite the same because it occurs a little bit after. But in health, the depolarization will always trigger the contraction. There's only one exception, and it's not in health, it's by no means in health, but there's a very dangerous cardiac arrest rhythm, and it's called pulseless electrical activity. And in pulseless electrical activity, you get this electrical activity in the heart, but it's not associated with any contractions. The muscle is depolarizing, but the myocardium is unable to respond kinetically because of severe uh, problems such as exsanguinating hemorrhage. That would be the only exception, pulseless electrical activity. Apart from that, P is atrial, QRS is ventricular, and T is repolarization of the ventricle. Now, we've said that the T is the repolarization of the ventricle, the ventricular myocardium, which we see here, the repolarization. So P is depolarization. QRS is depolarization, T is the only one that's repolarization. So obviously, we're going to need a repolarization of the atrial myocardium, but we don't see that. Well, that's because there's so much electrical activity going on in the QRS that the repolarization of the atrial myocardium, which of course takes place, it has to take place, but we don't see it because it's buried in the QRS complex but there will be one, there has to be, otherwise the atrial myocardium couldn't depolarize to generate the next atrial systole. Now with practice, these ECG readings can tell us all sorts of things. We can do positional ones called 12 lead ECGs. They'll tell us about the normal conducting pathways. They'll tell us about heart damage. They'll tell us if the heart is enlarged and they can also tell us what's causing myocardial pain. So well worth learning the basic QR, PQRST. And then with experience, you'll realize that this has lots of implications for pathology, patient assessment and patient management.